This is Pastor Nathan. Welcome to the Sitting With It podcast. Each week I sit down with someone from my congregation to discuss the past Sunday's sermon. I hope this helps all of us to go deeper with the sermon, thinking about it, digesting it, and living it out in our lives. Let's get into it. So on Sunday, I was away, and Tracy was actually the one that brought the sermon, and so we're doing something a little bit different this week on the podcast, mostly because I was out of the office last week and never lined anyone up to be on the podcast, and Tracy's here, so he got suckered into being on the podcast with me. So he's uh, sitting in my normal seat, and I get the view of everyone else and realize how distracting my office looks when we're recording the podcast (laughs) um, for everyone else. Um... But yeah, so uh, I'm actually going to be giving my reflections. I listened to the sermon um, one time and then kind of like went back to key parts, listened to them again, and then also was looking at the some of the sermon study resources we put out to kind of wrap my brain around some of my own reflections. And then Tracy's going to be, uh, he's memorized all the questions to ask me, and he's going to be uh, asking me the questions. So the, the main kind of content topic of the sermon was about laying it down. Um, looking at the things of our life that we lay down in order to lift Christ up. Um, and that, yeah, that was kind of the main point. And so then I'm going to hand it off to you to hand it back to me. Ah, uh, yes, how the tables have turned. <laughs> so, Nathan, uh, what are some of the main takeaways that you uh, noticed that you actually kind of uh, are uh, thinking about more, reflecting on some of the things that stood out to you from the sermon on Sunday? The idea of laying laying things down in order to lift Christ up, I really liked the way that like you kind of summarized the whole passage with that. Um, it was interesting. I was in reflecting on it, was thinking like I tried to come up with that phrase again of what it was you said laying, and I wasn't sure if it was like laying stuff down, laying it down, laying things down, uh, and then the AI uh, resources actually made it laying burdens down, and I was like, I didn't even remember that. Um, never use the word burdens. Never use the word burdens. Well, that's what AI thought you were talking about, is laying down our burdens <laughs> in order to lift Christ up. Um, I think you did a great job of drawing out like what was in the passage and helping me to see it in a way I wouldn't have necessarily seen it on my own. And this flow from like Paul talking about what he is laying down and has laid down, and then encouraging them to, the, the Philippians, to lay things down. Um and that movement from kind of Paul to them, and then sneak preview where we're going to go next week or this week, of uh, that Jesus actually is the pattern for this, right? So Paul has patterned his life off of Jesus, and now the Philippians are patterning their life off of Paul. And it tied in with some things I've been reflecting on anyways myself of, um, like, I prepare a majority of our sermons here, and so I'm constantly thinking about scripture, trying to help people apply scripture in their own lives. And even with doing this podcast, like that's one of the key questions. How are you applying this in your life? And I've been kind of like convicted would be maybe the right word. It's kind of a strong word, but um, I've been reflecting on, uh, like I don't always ask that question every week of myself Hmm. in preparing the sermon. So I spent a lot of time thinking about like, what will this look like in different people's lives? I even have a little application grid that I can like point to like, what does this sermon mean for a widow who's in their 40s or for an unemployed person who's in their 60s or for a, like, you know, all these different grids of like who we are as people um, for, you know, for a parent or a step parent or, um, but like, I'm not on there. <laughs> right. Yep. So like I would check some of the boxes, but it, yeah, that, so I think that's one takeaway from the sermon is for me to maybe like be a little more like Paul, take one out of Paul's playbook and start each week. Like, I think I'm actually going to start early on in the sermon process, just reading the passage and thinking about like, what does this mean to me? Um, before I do the exegesis, before I do the study, before I'm like, what is Paul saying? How does it apply to the Philippians? And then bridging the hermeneutical bridge between the first century context and our context, right? All the things we do as preachers. Um, before I do any of that, like, I, I think I need to just start with like, what do I feel the Holy Spirit is is teaching me through this passage? And that may or may not end up in the sermon, but uh, I think it's probably just an, an important practice. Um, so yeah, that was one takeaway for me. And then I think related to that, um, 
so so Paul's kind of talking about what he's laying down, and there's that verse um, that I say Philippians is the most memorized book. I don't know if there's mm. any data to back that up, but it's just filled with these one-liners, right? Yeah, yeah. So where he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And um, I think you read a quote from someone, I forget which Gordon it was, either Gordon Zerby, I don't have to pronounce his name, or Gordon Fee, yeah. of um, like that for many of us, it's to live as Christ plus yeah. work. Gordon Fee. Yeah. Gordon Fee, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and you talked about, I forget if this was the same part of the sermon, but you talked somewhat about the shame that can be attached to feeling like you haven't laid enough down, right? Or feeling like, well, for me, I don't want to suffer. And so it's it like, I don't want to give up all of this stuff for Christ. And it was interesting because my journey's been a like similar but different journey. So there was a lot of, still a lot of shame around that topic for me, but in the opposite direction, whereas a teenager, like I embraced that message and I was like, yeah, I'm giving up everything. Like my prayer was, God, I'll go anywhere for you. I'll do anything for you. Um, I broke up with my only girlfriend other than Dana because essentially I felt like she was a hindrance in my spiritual journey at the time and my relationship with God. And then I fasted from girls for a year. So as a like 18 year old boy, I was like, I'm like not interested in dating, not even thinking about it. Uh, so like, I went all in, right? <laughs> I was like, no, it's only Christ. Um, my my uh, degrees that I got in my undergrad was 100% focused on like what I felt God was calling me to in my life. I wasn't sure if I was called to vocational ministry, but I didn't care about what my vocation was. I was only focused on how I could serve Jesus. And so there was like no thought of what I was going to do for work, no thought of family. I thought I was going to move to the other side of the world, leave my family community behind. And what I came to find was in the midst of that, like a lot of that was motivated by shame. Um, and there was no life in that. Like, and I don't think that's what Paul actually is calling us to. Like, so I think in our minds sometimes when we think about, oh, it's all Christ and it can't be Christ plus these other things. We imagine somebody who's done all of that, right? I even literally like, uh, like there was a sermon where the pastor was talking about something. I literally cleared my entire bank account out, like all of the money that I had in my bank account and gave it away. And and what I found, like having like checked all those boxes, I feel like like Paul can say, Paul's going to say that later in Philippians here, right? Where he's like, yeah, if you want a model of what checking all the boxes looks like, I've done it all and it's all rubbish. Mm -hmm. And I came to the point of seeing that too. Like, I don't think that was actually following in the way of Jesus because Jesus doesn't do all of that stuff right? Like he's still, he's got friends. He has community. He doesn't go that far from his hometown. Um, he has finances, even if they're not his own, like he's connected with very wealthy people who are supporting him and caring for him. Um, and so some of my journey has been like, what does it mean to lay down Nathan and pick up Christ? What does that mean? And what does it look like if, if it's not just ignoring everything in life other than Jesus. Um, and so, so my reflection was, like, I think it looks like Christ in my work. Mm -hmm. Like, rather than saying, okay, well, it's either Christ or it's, like, my work plus Christ. Like, what does it look like, not Christ plus my work, but Christ in my work, Christ in my family? Christ in my finances. It doesn't mean I have to get rid of my money to follow Jesus. It means I have to think about how I'm actually using my money in following Jesus. And so then that reflection, yeah. So this is where it, like, it actually was a very meaningful and impactful sermon for me because I would say some of my journey over the last 10 years of like wrestling with what does it look like to be a husband, a father, a pastor of a congregation, um, like in all of these things and still focused on Jesus. Uh, like if it's not the old way, the way I did it in my teens and early twenties, I've just kind of ignored the question, just to be honest. Like, <laughs> like essentially I was like, I don't know what it looks like. I think I was too far off the deep end one direction. So I just kind of have, to be honest, just really ignored that question for the last 10 years probably. Yeah. And so thinking about like, what does it look like now to lay down Nathan and pick up Christ? Um, and when I say ignored, I mean, I've consciously ignored the question. I think that 
it still permeates. I mean, that is what the Christian life is, right? But I haven't thought in those terms intentionally because I think it was it was in an unhealthy way for me at one point in my life. In picking the question back up, it's made me realize like, oh, yeah, there's some stuff that's out of line. Yeah, I mean, one, just to name it, and I'm getting right into the application there question here. Just I've, I've disagreed with you. Not really disagreed, <laughs> but like I've pushed back on the themes of the sermon. I'm getting that because you don't even need to be here. I could just That's do right. this. I was <laughs> say, we're almost done. Right? <laughs> we're almost there. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how many people know or not, but a kind of our living situation right now, and you're familiar with this, right? So we're like the house we're living in is not actually our house. Uh, we sold it, I don't even know, two, two and a half years ago. Since then, the market has shot up significantly, and um, our savings have not shot up at the same rate because we're getting a 5% interest rate. The market's going up by 10%. So essentially, we're priced out of the market. Like for the last two years, you know, I'm regularly looking at the housing market and know that if St. Luke's, who owns our property, were to come tomorrow and say, hey, we're taking it now, which they could, uh, we, we will not be able to afford a place to live comparable to where we're currently living. And, you know, thankfully like god's blessed us we're in a good spot we would it's not like we're going to be on the street but we might be in an uncomfortable living situation for the size of our family and kind of what we're used to and then in the midst of that also for the last year and a half like being self-employed for a quarter of my income and so there's a lot of pressure in all of that of feeling this like need to supply like to care for my family um and myself and you know so like finances is something i think about regularly living situation is something i think about regularly i'm constantly scanning the housing market and it's something i already was aware of and have been working on um but this sermon just kind of like pointed straight at it again of like yeah what does it look like to trust christ in that right it's so i'm not at a point anymore of like well i'm just going to give up our house if we're going to go live in a tiny home and like, we'll be fine, <laughs> which is where I would have been at my late teens, early 20s. Uh, and Dana moderates that for me a little bit and reminds me of reality. Uh, <laughs> but um, but like, what does it look like to, to trust and be like, no, I know that this is what God has called us to or where we're, we're supposed to be. And, and the word I would use, I'm kind of speaking around it. So I'm just going to go there, right? Like I've, I've been realizing in the last couple of weeks of just how much in my life is motivated by greed. And I never, ever would have thought of myself as a greedy person. Um, like, I like to think of myself as a very giving person who's always looking for the needs of others. Um, but, yeah, I've, I think God's been kind of highlighting a stream of greed in my own heart and in my own life, the way that I approach um, our resources as a family and and our needs that are real, but also I overinflate them in a way that I think probably is greed. Um and so what does it look like to lay down that fear, to lay down the selfishness that can be wrapped up in that in order to actually lift up Christ um, in a way that is Christ in my family, Christ in my home, Christ in my finances, rather than trying to get rid of all of that stuff, thinking that in some way that's going to make it easier to follow Jesus. So, Yeah. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. It's, yeah, it's, it's, much, it's much easier to um to deal with that question with just the radical responses right and and in the stage of life that both of us i i did the same thing like i <laughs> in fact when jenna and i were first dating i went and visited her at a conference that she was uh representing uh the seminary at uh, out in pittsburgh went and visited her she had a hotel room and i mean we weren't we weren't like engaged or we weren't married or anything. So like, we're not staying in the same hotel room. And so I told her, I said, my, I said, my plan is I am going to go down and sleep on the street and I want to just interact with the people that are there. And, I, and that's, you know, that's what I want to do. Like, that's my radical, you know, that's my radical way of doing it right now. And she absolutely did not let me do that. <laughs> so <laughs> she, she went and found, she actually had a friend in the area. So she went and stayed at that friend's house and I, I stayed in the, in the hotel room, but you know, in that stage of life, that's easy. It's, it's easy to make those radical choices and to answer that question in a way that uh, makes us feel good about all the sacrifices we're making and the radical ways we're living for Jesus. Yeah. And it's not as easy to answer that question in this stage of life with, with kids and 
bills and houses and uh, you know any anything else that that just has kind of gotten in the way of those easy easy responses. So um, yeah, I, I I appreciate the the wrestling that that you're doing, and um, yeah, like as you even in those passages of, of scripture, right, and hearing a sermon based out of those passages of scripture, like you said, there, there's just mantras and, you know, pithy phrases all over the place that are easy to memorize. They're easy to say like, yep, that's, that's me. That's what I'm going after. Um, what, what in there though, especially in this passage, and I'm sure you're wrestling with it with the passage for this coming week too, but what in there is, you know, kind of like what, what I refer to as easier said than done. Um, like, is there anything in that passage or that was kind of communicating the sermon that you're like, yeah, that's a great thing to think about. And it's nice for a sermon point, or it's great that Paul said that. And maybe the people back then knew what he was talking about, but now, like now in our current day, in our context, like that's just not the same or it's, it's, it's much easier said than done and how he's communicating it. Yeah. That's a great question because that was one of my reflections from the sermon is I think you did a great job of um, like explaining the passage and the context, but then you like entirely left the application up to us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like when I thought back through it, like I got to the end, I was like, Oh wow. Like that was good. I hadn't thought about this in this way, but then like thinking about what I would say for this and then like, how, how what is the application? And like, you did a great, like at the end, like, and people brought stuff up and laid it. So I'm assuming people applied it in their lives. But I was like, he didn't tell us how to apply this at all. <laughs> um, but I think that's what is the thing that's difficult about the passage that's easier said than done, right? Is that Paul is in prison. And Paul's like, yeah, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And for him, that meant something. And even for the Philippians, that meant something. And for us, I think it's just so foreign to our reality of our life that it's like, yeah, what does that really mean? What does that actually look like for me um, to say to live as Christ, to die as gain? Like the reality is I don't think about death all that often in my life. And that would be different for some people in certain stages of life. But still, if we are thinking about death, it's for very different reasons than Paul, right? We're not, yeah. we're not like suffering for the sake of the gospel in the way that he would think of it. And so if anything, I think we misapply that concept and think we're suffering for the gospel when we're really not. And so then it is like, well, yeah, what does that actually, what does that actually mean? Yeah. And I think that's easier said than done. And and so that, like, some of my reflection then too was where we often go with that, right? And it's some of why I like, like, taking larger sections is it forces us to wrestle with what Paul's actually saying. Because where I would have gone with that at one point in my life is, like, yeah, my life doesn't matter. And I would, and in a sense, it was like, if I'm not suffering, in concrete, real ways, the ways Paul was suffering for the sake of the gospel, then I'm not doing it right. So I'm going to make myself suffer. Like, that's the whole point of life is suffering, which I don't think is actually what Paul's saying. <laughs> um, and Paul in other places says, I know what it is to have plenty and to be in one, and I'm okay with both of them. So what Paul actually does to apply it to the Philippians is he talks about their relationships with each other, right? And so where for me it's easy to go to how I'm relating to stuff, which is actually just where I went with my own application, right? Um, although it would go, it would tie in with what I'm about to say too. Like for him, it's more about how I'm, my relationship with people. Um, and so it's not about like leaving work and, and working a ministry job. It's about like in my work, how am I treating people? Um, it's not about selling my house. It's about the house that I have how am I treating people, whether it's my family in my house or others? Like, is my house open to others? Is, do I see this as actually God's house that I'm using as a steward of resources that have been given to me? And so like compassion and standing firm in, in the community, uh, are kind of the two points that you made about how, what, how Paul's applying this to the Philippians. Paul's reality of life feels easier said than done, where I feel like there's this tangible piece that I latched onto was thinking about, yeah, it's less about, it's less centered on Nathan and who Nathan is and like, oh, I have to like suffer and lay all these things down. And if I, if I'm not suffering, I haven't done enough. And it's more, wait a second, am I loving? Am I, am I giving up what I desire for the good of others? Um, yeah, 
I don't know if that. Yeah, no, I, yeah, that's great. And you know, it, as you were talking, it made me realize like Paul, it, Paul existed in that stage of life that we were in 20 yeah. years ago or whatever, you know, um, when we were making those radical choices, like that was Paul's life. Yeah. And so that's why it, you know, we, we resonate, like we take it, it draws us in and makes us think that's what life is supposed to be. Right. And, but yeah, he's addressing this group of people that are not at all in a similar situation to him, you know? Right. And so, yeah, they're dealing with real life, family, community stuff that he just does not deal with on a regular basis. And yeah. Um, so, you know, you're, uh, yeah, actually that's an interesting. Yeah. So even think about, right. They sent Epaphroditus to him and he, he's going to say later in the letter, Epaphroditus like almost died for the sake of the gospel. And Paul's not like, and all of you should do that too. Why aren't yeah. you all out here coming to prison with me? No, he's like, I'm going to send Epaphroditus back because it breaks my heart that you guys are so concerned about him. So like, I'm going to alleviate your suffering. Right. Yeah. Um, and we so often, I, for whatever reason, at least in that, I don't know that all Christians do this, but at least in that brand or strand of Christianity that I grew up in, I think you grew up in, um, like we elevate Paul's lifestyle and even Paul doesn't do that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, he, yeah, I mean, he, you know, he does say, follow me as I follow Christ or, you know, different things like that. Um, and we see, you know, Jesus kind of treating different people um, in unique ways, like, you know, the, the young ruler, he says, go sell all you have, give it to the poor. Right. And then of course we, we try to we like project that upon ourselves. Like, okay, well, this is what we're all supposed to do. And, uh, okay. So, uh, Paul's, uh, addressing the, the Philippians, this community of people. And, um, so, you know, I, like you said, I didn't necessarily say here is the application. Right. Um, but, if, if Paul were addressing the swamp community and, mm -hmm. you know, we're saying like it kind of is an extension, an, an extension to addressing the swamp community. Mm -hmm. So you're a preacher. Like, how would you communicate what Paul is trying to encourage the, the Philippian community and our community? Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about a lot about individual stuff, right? And I mentioned that. Um, and so it's that that kind of makes it a little bit more complicated and confusing at times to think about, like, what is like, what are we actually applying here? Is this something I'm supposed to apply to my individual life? Is this something we're supposed to apply as a church? Like, are we supposed to be repenting of something together? What, what What's going on here? And so, like, w was there anything that, you know, as you reflected on the passage, reflected on the sermon um, from that standpoint of uh, this is something that is being written to a community? Is there any application or anything that kind of stuck out to you um, that you've reflected on for the community? Hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. And I would say just the honest answer to your question is no. Yeah. <laughs> There's not anything. <laughs> um, because I was trying really intentionally to listen to the sermon as like Nathan instead of Pastor Nathan. Yeah. Um, yeah. for the sake of of this exercise, just to be quite frank. Yeah. Sure. Um but yeah, so it's an interesting question. Um, what, what is the application, not just for me as a person, but for us as a church? And I would say like, so sometimes when we think about app, or I'll speak for myself. Sometimes when I think about application, I can get caught up and think it has to be something new, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, well, we got to do more. We have to do different. We have to do extra. So like, what's the thing we're not doing right now that we should be, we ought to be doing, or the thing we have to repent of. Yeah. Um, and I would say this sermon actually, is like an encouragement to us as a congregation mm. and a like rather than a corrective maybe a warning mm -hmm. um because i think at least in my time here i've seen this congregation have really live this passage out yeah. um that we are willing to lay down our own desires for the good of the community um we've had some difficult things in the last 10 years and i've consistently seen the like individuals in the congregation be willing, even in our voting, to vote with the will of the congregation, even if it's what they not they personally maybe wouldn't desire. Mm -hmm. Um and like, you know, many of our votes here are close to unanimous. And I don't think it's that we just all a hundred percent agree, but I think that in the course of discerning things together, 
Um, there's those who decide to to set their own desires aside for what they believe is best for the community. And like that's what Paul gets to, right? He's talking about compassion, about standing firm together, about in our relationships, having the same mindset as, as Christ Jesus. Uh, he uses that word in, in like the, the common, if you have any common sharing, uh, which is that partnership language again, right? Mm-hmm. The, the koinonia fellowship um, that goes way beyond the surface level, but is like actually having this common heart together and common... Um, like risk together, taking risks that actually impact all of us equally. So, yeah, I think I think I've seen that here through diff- through things that are difficult, like COVID, through pastoral changes. Uh, I've seen the community really lay down their own desires, and so I would say, like, we're in a season right now that it could be easy to not do that in our relationship with our conference, right? And yeah. and as we as a board have been trying to walk, um, walk that journey of the last six to eight months of just asking the question, are we, are we connected in the right place? Um, or do these relationships that we've had for the last 300 years still make sense to us? Uh, is this where God's calling us to today? It could be easy to get caught up in conflict narratives for it to become us versus them, for us to start putting people down or trashing people. And I'll just be honest. I mean, I've gotten caught up in that at times, right? Like we, like, uh, we're not always the best version of ourself, right? And so um, I, I try to keep paying attention to that, being careful of that, and not getting caught up in in that in the midst of reevaluating relationships. Like I believe it's actually possible to reevaluate relationships without hating people. <laughs> yeah. uh, and to me, that's what Paul's calling us to in this passage, right? Is yeah. he saying like, lay down your desires, lay down your fears, lay down your selfishness, um, lay down these these your concerns, and instead lift up Christ. Instead, love others sacrificially. Um, have compassion for others. Do everything you can to view it from their perspective. Make their desires their, what they value more important than what you value. Right? What does it look like for us as a congregation in our conference where we have significant disagreement with some to actually say like we're going to value what the, they value, right? Like the us yeah. versus them is typically like, well, I'm going to fight for us and forget about them. What, it, what would it look like to say them, whoever the they are for us, um, to say like, no, what, what do they value? And can we actually make their values more important than ours? And, and that might mean us blessing the conference as we leave, right? It might mean saying, hey, actually what they value means it's not a great fit for us. And instead of us fighting for what we want, We're going to say, hey, do you know what? We're going to bless you guys to do what you're doing, and we're going to do our own thing. Uh, Or it might mean us sticking around in the conference, and when they leave, whoever the they is, um, or if they are still with us, to to honestly say, you know, what does it mean to actually care about what they value, uh, to understand things from their perspective? So, yeah, I I had not thought about any of that in relation to this sermon until you asked the question. <laughs> so uh, I guess if we're going there, we're going there. But that, if, if I was to suggest any application for us as a community, uh, I think that that might be, might be it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So what's the, what's the final word here, Nathan? What's the final word? Oh man, I didn't get to disagree with you yet. <laughs> well, what, then bring it. What you... <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, I think the final word is like it doesn't have to be that complicated. Like I think just keeping it simple. And I have been accused of making things more complicated than they need to be, and that's probably true. I have a tendency to do that. I see all the complexity. And like at the end of the day, it's like laying down our desires and picking up Christ's desires. Laying down the flesh, picking up the spirit, walking in the spirit. Um and that doesn't mean running away from the physical world, but recognizing that like the whole message of the gospel is that the Holy Spirit comes into this physical world to remake it with us in partnership with him. And so, yeah, I think that's it is like just not making it too complicated, not overcomplicating things, not getting caught up in the drama of life because there's a lot of drama in life. There's a lot of broken relationships and hurting people and hurting communities. And rather than getting caught up in that, just keeping it simple and it's about loving Jesus, loving our neighbors, ourself, and laying down anything that gets in the way of that. Amen. Thank you for sitting in the other chair this week and allowing me to 
interview you for the podcast. Thanks for inviting me. I'll have to do this again. (laughs) 